my God. You see, after that, my business exploded. Hey, come on, man. As I said, you need people in your life to bring out the best of you. You cannot do it. Most of the time, you don't even see it. Some of the times, you don't even see that you're brilliant. Because you're running around following other people and doing what other people say. You don't really, really what's going on inside. Somebody has to pull out the real you. Yeah? Pull out your Levi. Leave your Keith behind. Keith, Keith was a Scottish man. That's not me. So when Mandela shook my hand and I gave him my message, welcome Mr. President from the people of Brixton, Rastafari. I felt the power come through that I was not ready. Lord of mercy. <laughs> I felt <laughs> I was ready and I could slay anything. So that's why when they said dragons, then I said, bring it on. You know, and people were saying, Levi, you can't take the guitar. You have to be like how everybody else has been. Pretend like you're some, you know, Prince Charles or some, some white guy or something like that. You know, standing and speaking like you're some speaky spoky. I wanted to be the Rasta man from Brixton that sings songs and love the Lord. So, that's why I brought the guitar. It's never been done. Nobody had ever sang on Dragon's Den before. As a matter of fact, I could have been perhaps become a cropper on there because you know what it's like. Production makes the shows. So it could have gone pear-shaped if the Lord wasn't with me. But because he was there, you know, it can't go pear-shaped. But it could have. But it was the gamble of doing it. And that's what entrepreneurs does. He does it, well, he gambles, but he takes calculated risk. Because as I said, I had calculated and know that I was now ready. I felt absolutely confident that these dragons will never slay a Rasta man. I felt it. It may sound a little bit this and that, but I really felt confident that I could sing this song on this show and come away the victor. So when Peter said that, I can invest in you. For me, it was the vindication of everything. Absolutely everything. And now, Lord of mercy. I'm just sailing on a crest of a wind, guys. I've just opened my first restaurant. So don't call it a restaurant. It's a restaurant in Westfield. And it, you know, it just makes me feel so happy because it's the next level for me. Because you're only as good as the next level. Because you get to one point and that's it. You, you can't boast about being there, reggae, reggae sauce and all that. It's already been done. Your proving is about how you move to the next thing because that's what life is. It's not about sitting down here and doing one thing. It's about moving on. So building a chain of restaurants is now my dream. And ladies and gentlemen, you watch me go. Yes, you watch me go. You watch me go. So, it's been absolutely wonderful, ladies and gentlemen. It's been, it's been a great life. Oh, thank, you, thank you very much. But, you know, I take it from other people. You know, and again, I say to myself, I don't see myself as doing anything great or what have you. I'm only Levi Roots. I still live in Brixton where I've always lived. I've, I've moved. Most people think that, you know, I have a big house somewhere here over in North London or somewhere like that. But no, I still have the same friends that I've always had. My mother still lives up the road from me in Brixton. I still go around with my friend Lloydie Coxton, Festus and Blacker and all of us are still friends. We never change from it because I believe that everything will start falling off the minute you start to change. You know, you have to be you from the start to the very end. But like I said, be the best of you! All right. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some Q&As now, you know, and see if I can get some, some people to ask some really cool questions so I can give away some of, these, some of these presents that I have. So if you have a question, if you just put your hand up, I can just... I, I see you have your hand up first, lady. <laughs> Thank you, Levi. Shh. Restaurant. Can I just Cool. cool. My question, I'm Fatima, and Levi, it's been an honor you coming and speaking to us and sharing the secret to your success. You mentioned that there were three men who influenced your life. I've got down Bob Marley yeah. with his album Natty Dread, um, <laughs> Nelson <laughs> Mandela, Mandela yeah. and Singing the Cake. 
Who is the third man? Well, I'm going to ask the question so I can clear that up. Well, the third person in between these two great black yes. icons, yes. Bob Marley and Nelson Mandela, yes. in between them, yes. I've saddled in a six foot seven tall white man. Wow. Peter Jones. All righty. Because, and the reasons why I've done that. Yes. The other two has inspired me how to get the money. Yes, 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 yes. Bob Marley sings about if I live my life good as a raster man, everything, Ja will give you everything and all that. Yes. Nelson Mandela is telling me that said, you know, it's peace and prosperity and all them kind of stuff like that. Yes. Peter Jones are giving me the damn money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That's why he's in the middle. Next, Next question. Okay, comments. Something that uh, I remember, my relative, Bishop Esme Beswick, MBE, Absolutely. always telling me, in reference to yourself, that you always was determined. You used to go to the church, you used to drop off food, your mother was there, and so on. So what would you say made you so determined? I know you said be yourself, but what gave you the determination, the drive? Um, that's a really good question. It's a difficult one to answer that when you're in your own skin and you're like me, you're totally honest about yourself. Because as I say, I'm always so honest that I never see anything really inspiring in my own self. I always seek inspiration from others. So I started off by saying I was Robinson Jackson and I really meant that. And, and to answer your question, what makes me be able to do that? I have no idea. I really think that it's I think Rastafarianism has something to do with it. Because I think my life before I started to, 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 to Rasta was a bit different than that. You know, and that's why I got in all those troubles and gone to prison and all that because I wasn't focusing as, as Levi, the priest, the third son of Jacob, you know, as the, the man that ministers to the Lord, you know, the one that has the books and, and you know, the most entrepreneurial of all the prophets is the Levi. You know, and I wasn't functioning as, as my tribe back in those days. And it's when I found Rastafari that I, I realized that being Levi, that's a big thing. You know, the, being the prophet that takes care of everybody, then the one that always has the books in his hand and always reading and takes care of all the scriptures and everything. That is something that you've got to really be able to focus on. And, you know, I've been focused ever since I was, I've been a Rastaman. I know people have seen me with the sound and, and know that we were a bit, you know, here, there, and everywhere as young as young man. But as I said, I don't believe that Peter Jones and Dragons then changed me. What they've done, they've only just fish out the Levi and left the Keith behind. Because it was while I was the Scottish guy that I couldn't focus. My, I don't know where my... Because I, I, I investigated, actually, that 90% of Jamaicans have Scottish names because of the slave masters and all that where you were and sometimes you are your name you tend to function of who you are and I, I when i found out about that well, just after i left school i didn't want to be a keith you know i i wanted to be something else and it's when i found when i found me as who i am and i and i try to do a transfer that i i think i'd be able to do it but i don't think i have any magic formula for how i managed to do it at all i just be me I just be me Hi, um, my name is David Edwards and it's a real pleasure listening to you here today. One of the questions I have, and hopefully you'll be able to answer it, is in terms of, as, as you know, many black businesses start up and after two, three years, they hit that major problem of finance. Yeah. And from your perspective, how would you, or how could you give us advice in terms of obtaining the right level of finance yeah. to grow I, our business? I think that's a top question, you know. You might just win the book, you know, my bridging. <laughs> But let me answer it first and give somebody else a chance to win it book. That's a really cool question, but maybe somebody else has a, has a good question. Your question hits right at the heart of why, especially Jamaicans, and, and I'm going to sort of pigeonhole Jamaicans for a minute, just for a minute. Your question tells the real story of why we are such sort of behind the others in entrepreneurialism. Because... Because I'm saying his question really tells the story of why Jamaicans in particularly don't step out, you know, and be more successful because of long-term planning. We're always about short-term planning. But in saying that, there are no more entrepreneurial people, especially Caribbean people, than Jamaicans. 
No more. Absolutely. Because, because if you see a Jamaican, you check out how many Caribbean takeaways there are in this country. And you tell me every time you see a Caribbean takeaway, how much time you see an Antiguan takeaway, a Barbadian takeaway, uh, uh, you know, whatever from the Caribbean. You don't. You see Caribbean Jamaican takeaway. But do you see them after a few weeks? No. And the reason why I say that is because we are the most entrepreneurial minded people to start the business. We can start a business out of nothing. You know, if you say to, to, to a Caribbean person that, you know, sit two nailed in a piece of board, nail up that and make an office out there, within no time they do it. But can you sustain it? No, you don't. You know, and I think that that's one of our, the things that we are missing. We've got to learn to do things long term. When I was younger, don't tell me about doing a, a business plan for five years and I have to wait for five years before I get profit. I want it now. You know, give it to me now. I'm not going to wait around. And in some ways, I think slavery may have beaten a bit of that into us. I don't know where it comes from. But I have noticed it with my own self in the past. So I'm not saying about people. Really, I'm talking about my own self. Because I have started many a business when I was quite younger without the long-term planning. And it was always short-term. And when I came out of Dragon's Den, one of the key things that I had said to Peter when you know after when you get the investment you sort of go around the back and have a have a chat with your investors and one of the key thing that i'd said to him i just said to him how shall i play this you know and one of the things that he did say to me is that it's going to be a long time before you actually make any money you know because that's what it's about don't expect because investment money is about investment it's not about you going around and spend it. So that 50,000 pounds that I had on Dragon's Den that I won, which was actually the most money that I'd ever seen in my whole life at the time, I didn't even actually see that. That was in the business and you don't get to see that at all. And after about two years when people were saying that, you know, Levi have 30 million pounds and all these things like that, I was still really suffering. I was really still short of money because it is about the long term. But now 10 years later, Lord of mercy. Greetings, Levi. Greetings. Ruth. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very informative. I, you know, so the book, pass the book. I'll wait for your question because you might have a boom question <laughs> well, and upset him. I'm going to try. Um, uh, it's more to do with your cooking and the inspiration for your reason to cook. Yeah. Um, and what would be your favorite Jamaican meal? If you were to have meal of the day at your uh, restaurant, yes, and why, and what would be the accompanying beverage? Yeah, Thank well, you. you know, Caribbean food is moved on in leaps and bounds over the past ten years. It really has, you know, absolutely fantastic the way that the supermarkets and everyone is taking to it. It's been brilliant. One of the main things that's taken absolutely leaps and bounds in Caribbean food is curry goat. At my restaurant, it's become the absolute favorite. I think it's actually taken over jerk chicken which I thought would have been impossible in, in a kind of a restaurant environment. So that's one thing that we know, you know, in, as Caribbean food, that's really growing big time. Another one that's actually flying away at the moment is about plantain. Because all of a sudden, you know, mainstream people realize planting and a simple thing like what we take for granted every day is now flying out the supermarkets if you go into tesco's and you see where the planting is in tesco if you go there today by the time you go back later on the planting done and it's not caribbean people that's buying it so those things are my favorite the things that actually sell in caribbean stores right now because for me it's not about levi roots at this point it is about caribbean food because i've always got to be thinking of the bigger picture and if i if i can help to big up caribbean food to be up there with indian food and french and italian and all this until i, I think it would be fantastic not just for me but for the entire diaspora so i would say curry goat and price planting is my two favorite things because you know people are learning about them so much i'm gonna pass the book over to the man up there and i don't want nobody to win that that question there was really good yeah the gentleman in the suit up there Yeah. Um, Next question. <laughs> so, Levi, thank. Yes. Thank you for coming along. No problem, sir. Thank you for modelling for what's Put achievable your hand up if you want a question. for every single one of us. Yeah. 
and thank you for being a trailblazer because I want other people to know that what you've achieved is possible for them too. Yeah? Um, so I work as a business coach and one of the biggest struggles I find with my people is that everything in the head. Yeah? All of the plans for the business is in the head, it's in the head, it's in the head. And the first thing I have to say, put it down on paper. And, but I can't, I can't, and I really struggle with that. I want you to say something along those lines, please. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is a, a real, you know, massive problem for us again, you know, about, you know, writing things down as simple as that, making the business plan. You know, we can't, hustling was one of the worst things that I ever did. I never made any money when I was hustling. Hustling has destroyed us as a people, you know, it really has. Because the money doesn't go anywhere. Our, our black pound just seems to, in our hands and then it disappears. You know, unlike other the Jews and the Indians and all that, their pound or their money just goes round and round and round and round in the community. I was just comes in our hand and before you know it it falls through our very open open hands because our hands are always like this it's never you know it's never united like how we we tend to want to do our thing and fist and thing like that in real life and in business our hands are like that and the black pound just keep running through we got to have our plan so that we clasp our hands and we we retain the pound the black pound amongst our, our one another and that can only be by some serious planning i've seen on the internet you know about you know i don't want to mention any names and stuff like i'll be very careful you know people were saying about there's a brand that's been taking over grace's yeah. grace's stuff some of you guys may want to know what i'm talking about as i'm in the business i don't really want to want to go too deep in that but i agree that fire for them people there eh? no it's true it's true yes because we need it yes we need to have our own plan our own long-term plan so we can keep our pound together and stop doing that because as it fall out of your hand it drop in a feed them so that with my answer to it that we got to be able to have long term write things down have a plan there's nothing without a plan if you're not writing it down, it's, it's hustling. Hustling is when you don't write nothing down. You just hustle it by the head. Like when you sell weed or when you do them things there. Which I did a lot of that in my life. Going, my past life. It never made me any money. It just come and go and drop out of my hand and gone. But the minute I learned to do what the gentleman says. Write things down and planning and everything like that. My hand is like that. I ain't falling out no more. Be careful with that. Lady How many more questions, Levi? Greetings and abundance. My name is Zulema. Congratulations on your Rasta restaurant. I would like to ask you, do you actually go to other restaurants and taste their food? <laughs> and that inspires you to make your food even better. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and also, I'd like to know what you do to relax. Okay, cool. Because cool. you're a very busy man, <laughs> and I would like to know what makes you relax and how you relax, okay. and also, what's your next inspiration? Okay. Right, well, the food, going to other people's food, I'll get straight to that, because I know there's some anticipated answers. We know that there is a chain of um, Caribbean food that sort of splurted up all of a sudden around the country. And, and again, I've had people writing to me about it and all them type of thing there. I think she's right. I am, I am inspired by it in some ways because we need competitions in that. We don't need to, for us to be on our own going into markets that we, that we don't know about. So we need that competition. So that is a good thing. But it just goes back to what I was saying that when I do visit some of these restaurants and I see, for instance, you know, they're written down on, on the menu and they're called the curry goat, goat curry. And when I look, they're a mix, they're a mix curry goat with, with rice and peas and all these things. It just makes me angry because I'm passionate about our cuisine. And I want to see it done properly. You know, it's just the same like any, anyone else that has a cuisine out there and, and they see something that they've grown up with done in a derogatory way or a way that's not against their culture. So even though I do agree that we should be, you know, bigging up other Caribbean-type restaurants and not cussing them down like we normally would do, 
But what we want, we want respect for our cuisine. Especially if you're not from that particular country. Because a lot of people now are seeing the opportunity of Caribbean food. They don't come from Caribbean, but they have a whole lot of money to invest in Caribbean. There's nothing wrong with that. All we're asking them to do is just to respect the culture. Because the food and the culture goes together, including the names. Levi, how, how many more questions will I you take? take? Two more. Just two more questions then. Okay. Good to meet you. Glad that you're here. It's with regards to... So, oh, my name is Yvonne Bailey. Yvonne. I run a club for young people. It's called Creative Culture Club. I'll be doing award ceremony for young people, recognizing the achievements. I'm having major problems with that. Can't get funding. Anyway, what I want to say is with regards to what you just mentioned, the other people encroaching and taking over our cuisine. But three years ago, I read in the local garden in Walton Forest, <laughs> a, 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 an establishment was coming in the vicinity mm -hmm. and it started up the West Midlands. They had loads of outlets, yep. Caribbean restaurants. And I'm thinking, what? Fantastic. Some black persons were really good. I must go and support. But I read in the paper, looked up the name. When I saw that name, I said, what? Caribbean people don't have that kind of name. Something's wrong. I don't know whatever it was. Checked it out, Sri Lankan. So we have a Sri Lankan person, along with an English person, running a chain of Caribbean restaurants, most successful all around the country. They've opened in Walton Forest, they've opened Ealing, they've opened everywhere. And what I want to know is, everyone, so many people are supporting them. Now, when we have our own, hardly anybody support us. They're making all the money. We're not keeping. Loads of black people go to that restaurant. We don't keep that money within us. It's given to other people. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, that really distressed me. And I contacted the council. I know somebody who worked there. I said, why did you not give it to other people who've been there for years, that spot? Yeah, yeah. And he said to me, black people don't think big. We always think small. We have one little tiny here, one little tiny. But these people, they think big. Yeah, so time, they've taken over Times have yeah. changed, you know, times have really changed. And I, and I do understand what you're saying because I, I did address that, you know, a minute ago that I, I do know the company that you're talking about. But I have said that I don't think that there's nothing wrong with that personally because, like I said, we need the competition because it's not like we have the millions of pounds to go around and build a chain of restaurants called Caribbean food. And to be fair, to be fair with that chain, Caribbean, the, the name Caribbean and the potential for Caribbean is now gone around the entire country that I cannot do as yet. Even though they're not doing the food to the best of our ability, but it's still doing it in some ways. We cannot be afraid of competition here when we're starting out. Starting out is a very difficult place to be. You, you can't be all brash and bold when you get there and you bring everything. I mean, even where I am in my restaurant, and to, to let you know what I'm talking about, some of the stuff that I do in my restaurant are not entirely authentic because I cannot do it because of the way that the demographics is. For instance, the curry goat. I have had to learn how to do the curry goat by using the bones in one of the mesh bags inside of the curry goat to cook it with it and then to remove the bag afterwards. Now, my granny would kill me if she hear me doing that. <laughs> But when I explain to her and tell her that mainstream people who come to my restaurant, because you know I have a large support of mainstream people, those that come cannot handle the, <laughs> the sucking out the bone like what we do. And they complain when you, when you take up a scoop of curry goat and it have all the bone and you put it on the plate and half of the food is like bone. So I've tried that and that doesn't work. So what I've had to do is knowing that sometimes we do need to dub things up. And I've dubbed up the curry goat by, as I say, boil it, cooking it with the bones so I can take out the bones afterwards. And you get the marrow and the flavor of what the bones had. But then you just don't have it to slurp it and everything like that when you're doing it. So again, we have to be very careful in how, in how we cuss down things and just think very carefully. Do we want success? Because in Dragon's Den, when the second Dragon's came in for me, I could hear... Millions of black people shouting at the TV screen, Levi Roos, don't take the deal. <laughs> because you remember, I only asked for 25,000 pounds. I asked for 50,000 pounds for 20% share. But two dragons came in and I had to double the amount. Yeah? So I had to give away double the shares that I went planning to do. But then I asked myself the question, 
Do I want to hold on to this something that's a secret and everybody Caribbean people love it and every Jamaican love it and I hold on for it forever and it stay down yes sir? Or do I want to let it go a little bit to fly and watch it fly go on and go on and go on and then inspire people in some other ways? And I think that's how, it, that's how I've managed to do that because even though the deal wasn't perfect for me, but that was 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter now because of that long-term planning. If I was thinking short-term, then maybe I wouldn't have taken the deal. But it's long-term. One more. One more question. Greetings. My name is Sister Marcia. Hi, First Sister of Marcia. All, which, which island, which um, parish you say is the best um, parish? Island? Lord of mercy! Come again! Come again! Well, I can tell Come you that again. Tell Toots and the Mayor tells her from there. Cocker tea is from Marcus there. Marcus Garvey, yes. Bob Marley. Luciana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Um, I represent a group called SRF, Outreach Community Group. And I just, it's a group, um, separation, loss, and renewal with families. I just want to know, what sort of relationship did you have with your mother? Not at the fact that you grew with your grandmother. But so what sort of relationship you had with your mother? Oh, man. Oh, that's a cool question. You asked me about my mother. You, you win a CD, my dear. You win a CD. <laughs> well, you know it's as i says my grandma is everything to me you know because she was the one that really was mother and father to me when both my parents left when i was five when i was five years old she taught me everything that i that i knew but when i eventually came to this country at the age of 11 then my mother took over because i had to re get to renew her again because having not known her because i was a bit young when she left but she picked up the baton and run with it and i tell you I've been running with her and been the closest mother-son, you know, relationship that I could ever think. Amen. It was her birthday Amen. the other day. And mother's Day, I'm going to big her up for Mother's Day. So she's the best. Absolutely the best. Oh, Levi, we are so glad that you have come. To, you have... Re which way? Are you over there? I'm here, yes. I'm here my dear. I'm pulling the mic. <laughs> I'm here, my dear. There? Right I'm here in front of you. Touch me, touch me. Put out oh, your hand. I'm so yeah. sorry. I've been looking the wrong way. No, man. I'm here. I'm here for you. <laughs> Tell me. You know what? I've, I've been listening to you all the way through, and I've been listening to you as you progressed with your story. And I'm hearing you found yourself in a way what we would hear from Marcus Garvey as philosophy and teacher of Marcus Garvey when you found yourself, when you needed to build yourself. And I hear that your mother, your mother, because us mothers, because my, my father is from Clarendon. My father came over here from Clarendon. He worked in bike shop. He, he, he believed. Everything that we can do, if, if, I match up, if, if that dad mashed up something in the house, it would turn it into something else. Anything that you had, you'd turn it into something else. But what I would like you to tell us, are you, from what your mother taught you and what you got from your restaurant and your restaurant vibration, are you going to bring a standard? Because we don't want a Michelin standard anymore. We want a restaurant standard now. Yeah. We want, and we want, we want the symbol of the restaurant standard to be the guitar that your mother gave you that brought you alive. And we want to hold uh, that restaurant yeah, standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they say that they put in the goat on the cuisine in Britain and the rest of the world, because they never used to eat goat, look what goat was. It is a standard. One standard would be the maybe the one standard for the, the clarity version, and we have one standard for the other version. So we have the one, the people with the real thing, they will be eating with the bone, because we like the bone. Yeah. And the people who don't want to eat the right thing, they can eat the cheaper version without the bowl. Hey, give me a hug. Uh, <laughs> Go on, sister. Yeah, bigger, Last bigger, question bigger, from bigger. a young man because the children haven't had a chance. Ask a question quickly. Uh, if it's a good question, do I get something for free? Of course, of course. <laughs> let me give you let me give you the present first for taking the mic. Just for taking the mic and starting so you, you win a prize. Just there alone. Just there alone. Okay. All right. So, um, when you, um, when some, if something happens to you or if you die or something, would you like your children or your family to continue your legacy and, um, but be in your shadow? Or would you rather them make their own business like by themselves in what they want to do, but have a lower chance of success? Lord of mercy. What a question. Yo. <laughs> oh, Good question. God. I think he's going to dig me out there. <laughs> it's gonna dig me out because I'm gonna have to be really honest. I'm gonna have to be really. He's, he's drawing me out, man. 
How do I start this? Because I, I got I to... God, it's, it's such a hard question. Three years ago, and I'm going to be honest because all my life is out, is out, my daughter is washing out my line, so <laughs> let's start. Three years ago, one of my daughters came out against me. I think some of you may, may have known that. Um, and it's one of the most difficult things for me to talk about, but when a young man so brave can ask me something like that, I've got to be honest to him and let him know where I'm coming from. So three years ago, one of my daughters had come out, to the, the bloody Daily Mail again, had got under the skin of my children, you know, after they were lurking for years and trying their best to disrupt my flow. And they couldn't find anything. They've interviewed every girlfriend that I've ever had. And, you know, everybody that I've ever smoked a spliff with, you know, they've all come out and that. And then they started to attack my children. And the point that my daughter was making is that so she never get enough money from me. <laughs> things like that. But, you know, for me, it's not about giving my kids a blank check and expecting them to just live a life like how you see these kids on TV. I want my children to work hard for what they have. I, I want them to see me as an inspiration, not a checkbook. You know, that's, that's what it was about. And I stood firm, I really stood firm with her, my daughter that did that, because I really believed it. And when I spoke to other entrepreneurs that's in my position, and when I read about, you know, other people that has managed to usurp into some kind of, you know, business success, they all think the same thing, you know, because if I had a silver spoon in my mouth, I wouldn't be the Levi Roos that I am today. I would have been a walkless smuddy. So I, I, I always taught my kids that says, you have to work hard for it. The only thing that I, that, I, that I wanted when I was growing up, I wanted my parents to be my role models. Because when I think about what my mother and my father did in their 20s, to have six children and to leave them behind in Jamaica, come to England, buy a house within two years, get the job and start to send for them one at a time until they're all here. That's a big thing. I don't need to look for inspiration elsewhere. My mother and my father did that. And when I see the hard work that they've done, all I want to do is just see that and I have to get up and I have to run with that baton. So for me, I, I have a four-year-old son now and I'm, I'm teaching him the same thing. You know, I'm telling him that, look, I look after you for now and do the job as a parent. But when you turn an adult, you have to do your job as an adult. That's by making your own. When me dead and gone, you can have everything when me left behind. But in this instance, you have to work. You have to work. Thank you, Levi. Um, I don't want you to leave just yet, just yet. Uh, we're going to have a raffle um, prize here for Levi. So we'll be selling raffle tickets to raise money for our Action for the Homeless program. I've got a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. What do you think about us converting uh, double-decker buses uh, for the homeless, our Action for the Homeless program? I think it's a brilliant idea. Yes. Absolutely brilliant idea. I love, and I think those double-decker buses, they stand for something because it all stirs up, you know, images of our mind of where we're from and, and London and the great city that, that it is. So anything to do with double-decker buses, I'm for it. Even a, rest, a restaurant in a double-decker bus sounds cool. <laughs> we're yeah. going to put reggae, reggae <laughs> sauce in the kitchen, okay, and serve well, up some food. I remember, I did say that somebody who hasn't tasted the sauce before, who had put up their hand? Okay. God have mercy. So much people. <laughs> choose I, one. I, I choose Gerald, one. choose one. All right. So all the people is vouching for this young gentleman here. Yeah. You, you don't see them young man, but there's all the people behind you doing this. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to that young man. They've nominated you. So the, the raffle is to raise money for our Action for the Homeless program. And as you heard about our equality, Action for Equality and Diversity is about that. And you'll see a presentation after the break. But in the meantime, we have, uh, we would like to honor you today. And um, we would like to invite Dr. Dorian Wilson onto the stage. We would like to invite uh, the Honorable Chief Benny Wender onto the stage. And Shatai, Adrian, onto the stage, please, right now. If you could please make your way onto the stage. Can you, uh, can you do the honors? Can you do the honors? Um, 
We'll start with Levi. Thank you. Um, Working Action Group have Hall of Honor Awards. If you've been to one of our events before, where we think that someone in our community is worthy. <laughs> what shut eye? I'll explain shut eye significance in a minute. Working Action Group came out of his group, the United Melanin Society. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I would like to present, I'd like some photographs, please, as well, if that's okay. Our Working Action Group Hall of Honor Awards to uh, Levi Roots. Can you please give him a, a round of applause for his work in the community and for always being in touch with the community. Thank you so much. Can I take a picture with him? Hang on. Can I jump in? Yeah. Well done. Well deserving. Can we all jump in? All together now. Everyone. All right, we're going to sing again, yeah? One minute, one minute. Okay. But I'd just like to say thank you, Levi, for coming here today and for sharing your knowledge, your personality, your experience, and uh, just being here with us. We just appreciate you taking your time to, to come to the community. And, you know, we love you. Say, we love you, Levi. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Dorian Wilson, this woman is inspirational. She, she is totally inspirational to me. I've never met anyone like her. When it comes to equality and diversity, she is the country's leading equality and diversity. She got that doctor, you know. She never got that doctor from the, from the, she had to work hard for it. And as a black woman, you know how hard it is when we hit those ceilings. And she's been at Middlesex University for 22 years to earn it. 22 years. So this sister, this mother, this beautiful queen and woman is deserving of our Hall of Honor Awards. And I would like her to receive it with all of our love. Can we say we love you, Dr. Dorian Wilson? Love you. <laughs> Thank you. There you are. Oh, sorry, photograph. Thank you. And um, next is uh, the Honorable Chief Benny Wender from West Papua. <laughs> This man is the most courageous man I've ever met in my entire life. And when I mean courage, this man has had gun put to his head and escaped it. This man has been incarcerated in prison and escaped. Yeah, this man has traveled from West Papua, which is in Melanesia, which is 250 kilometers off the coast of Australia. Melanesia, the black islands that you didn't even know about. This man's country is under genocide and he goes around the world fighting for the freedom of our people. And for that, he, to me, he's, an, he's a legend and he stands amongst legends. Thank you. So I honor in the Hall of Honor Award to Chief Benny Wender of the Free West Papua Campaign and the United Liberation Movement for Free West Papua. We honor you today as a person who is the most courageous person in our community. We honor you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite you to uh, meet my friend here. Don't be shy. Uh, and um, we call him Shatai for obvious reasons. But the reason why he's here is because of the fact that he's a legend when it comes to social media. And Working Action Group was formed out of his social media group, the United Melanin Society. 
and the changes that they wanted to make in our community today and the changes that we're making every day. So he's a great poet as well and he knows it and he inspires us all. So because of the fact that his tireless work and unifying hundreds of us, literally, um, I just wanted to honour him for his contribution to our inspiration and knowledge because he pumps nothing but pure wisdom through social media. I honour you today, Adrian Shatai. Yay! So, I just want to say to everybody, if we could take a picture together. <laughs> okay, if we could just say uh, to everybody, yeah, everyone in this room, right, we love you, okay? One, two, three. We love you, okay? We love you. And we thank you for being here today. And we thank you for the honour. Please buy a raffle ticket because it's for a good cause. It's for action for the homeless. And you'll see a film about it after the break. We're going to have a half an hour break. But I would like you all to sing out... Please, Levi, if we can sing you out. Is that okay? Yeah? All right, ready? All right, yeah. You, I'm not going to sing because you make me feel shame, yeah? <laughs> Listen, when he sings it, it sounds so nice, I can't sing it twice, yeah? So if you could, we could all sing with you, reggae, reggae sauce. And can we all buy his products and we can we go to his restaurant and support his business? Can we do that? Can we circulate the black pound? Can we do that? No, louder. Can we do that? Can we do that? Thank you. Okay, Levi. Okay, ready? Yes. All right. It's so nice I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae, reggae sauce. Hot reggae, reggae, reggae sauce. Just like my baby, it's the perfect delight. It's got some peppers and some... Some spice! And spice. Herbs and spice. I respect you, whatever you say. To reggae, reggae sauce. Reggae, reggae sauce. Working Action Group, on behalf of Working Action Group, and find your voice. Where's Sir Dougie? Sir Dougie, can you come and just quickly say a word to say goodbye to everyone? Uh, our guests. No, we're having a break just for half an hour. Half an hour. What's the time now? What's the time now? Sorry? 6.35? So actually, can we be back here for 7 o'clock? Yeah? Make it, yeah? Is that all right? Oh, okay then. First, big up to Levi Roos and the working at the group. Come on, give him a clap. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Now then, we're going to have a break for exactly half an hour. So please network, mingle around. And then we have the second half to... Um, the dude. And also some raffle tickets as well. Um, you got raffle tickets there? At the, at the front there, the foyer there, yeah? Please get your raffle tickets. So please, 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 because we're on a tight, tight program, right? Buy your raffle tickets, mingle around, patronize the stores, then come back in second half an hour's time, yeah? Okay then, peace. Somebody put some music in my food for me. Give me some reggae, reggae sauce. Hot reggae, reggae sauce. It's so nice. I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce. Hot reggae, reggae sauce. Just like my baby, it is the perfect delight. It's got some peppers and some herbs and spice. Me want some reggae, reggae sauce. Hot reggae, reggae sauce. It's so nice with your fried chicken. Make burgers, finger licking. On your barbecue and your drumsticks. Put some reggae, reggae sauce on your dish. So nice with fish and chips. And in a vegetarian dish. As a marinade or as a deed, send me blessy reggae reggae sauce. Nice up your chips, reggae reggae sauce. Hot reggae reggae sauce. 
It's so nice. I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. You can eat it with some crackers. Steam down with two fat snappers. Some okra and some spinners. Swimming in some coconut juice. In Jamaica's national dish. In the ackee and in the salt fish. You can have it with what you wish. In a Chinese, Japanese, everything well crisp. Reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. It's so nice. I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. Reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. Reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. Yeah.